Here we go. Uh, so this is the Magician's Nephew video. I'm going to kind of go back to where we left off before last week and then do a fairly quick run through of things along with a lot of the biblical symbolism, which hopefully you caught most of uh, if you're paying attention with your reading. So let's take a look at this. First things first, Aslan is a lion. Uh, and if you know this about the tribes of Israel, one of the tribes of Israel is symbolically associated with a lion. I'll give you a second to try and figure it out. It is the tribe of Judah. And guess who is in the tribe of Judah from the Bible? That would be Jesus. Um, so very symbolic there. I'm not sure if that was intentional by Lewis, but if so, well done. Um, now, I'm going to go to page 114 in the little book, um, which is chapter, it's the fight at the lamppost, chapter 8, uh, is where I'm going to start. I'll keep saying the page numbers. I have the little book with me. If you're not in the little book, I'll keep you up to date on what chapter it's in, and you can maybe be able to find it because it should be within a page or so of what I say. Um, so first things first, when they leave London. Um, so it's kind of pell-mell and crazy as they all get out of London. They end up um, basically in this place that is described as nothing. There were no stars. It was so dark they couldn't see one another at all, and it made no difference whether you kept your eyes shut or open. And they could tell they're standing on something solid, but they can't really feel anything. Uh, and I just love the responses of the different characters. Uh, it's very telling of how they view themselves and who they're really thinking of, uh, their reaction to all of this. So first the witch speaks up and says, my doom has come upon me, which not very comforting. So initially, immediately the witch's reaction is despair and selfishness. Uh, then Uncle Andrew just starts babbling and then asks for alcohol because he is not the best person. So he he is focused also on himself and not on others. And then the cabbie. Uh, and the, the cabbie has a good, firm, hearty voice. He says, keep cool, everyone. And that's why I say, no bones broken. Good. Well, there's something to be thankful for straight away. Uh, which it's, it's interesting that he immediately goes to thankfulness and the others are going to well, I need something to make me feel better, or it is the end. Uh, just total despair. It's all over. Um, so he he immediately is grateful. Also, if you notice some of the stuff he says, it's spelled weird. That's because Lewis is trying to show a South London accent, which any parts that I read of the cabbie, I will read in a South London accent, just for edification's sake. Um, he said, well, that's something you'll be straight for, uh, thankful for straight away. More than anything, uh, after someone can expect falling that way. Now, if we've all fallen down in some diggings, it might be a new station planned for the underground, which is like a tunnel underground. So he thinks, oh, we must have just fallen down through a crack in the street. And the good thing is none of us are, are injured and we aren't dead. So that is great. Um... And someone will come and get us out presently, see? And if we're dead, which I don't deny it might be, well, you've got to remember that worse things happen at sea, and a chap's got to die sometime. <laughs> uh, and there ain't nothing to be afraid of if a chap's led a decent life. If you ask me, I think the best thing we could do to pass the time would be to sing an hymn. Uh, so he immediately just rationalizes himself through it of, well, none of us are injured, so that's good. We've probably fallen in a tunnel. If we are dead, there are way worse ways to go. It was gonna happen eventually. And honestly, why don't we just sing a hymn to be uh, to, to comfort each other? So he starts singing a hymn. Uh, Polly and Diggory join in. Uncle Andrew and the witch, of course, do not. Because uh, why would they? Um, and then Uncle Andrew starts to pull Diggory away. And what I want you to try and look for with the reading, which you should be basically done with the reading at this point, but try to see what the sins each character tends to fall into because each of them has very much a train of thought that they always follow so with the witch she is very selfish and very centered on herself and uncle andrew is the same way and both of them are extremely prideful uh which is quite dangerous uh, so with uncle andrew he starts to try and get him away to save both of them but mostly himself uh and and diggory says well of course not that's that's absolute cowardice uh, which is another thing that Uncle Andrew suffers from, and also the witch in many ways, but she just hides it better. Uh, but she is also uh, pretty pretty selfish. Um, and 
then they start hearing a sing, uh, a singing, and uh, they're hearing a song, and it seems like the song is actually creating the world, which it is. And if you haven't noticed that in terms of a reference, God spoke the world into being. Aslan sings Narnia in, and one of the things that C.S. Lewis often said was, "It says spoke, but I honestly think God probably sang for part of it because of the world that He created. There had to be some singing involved, uh, and." I think that's a pleasant thought. Um, anyways, uh, and the stars, they sound like silvery voices and you start getting constellations. Uh, and then when they're actually able to see the ground, please notice the ground is rock and water, both of which are symbolic of Christ, uh, the living water and the cornerstone, and also symbolic of Moses who struck the rock and water came out. And then finally, one of the interesting things is it says there are mountains. Now, if you remember this, and I've told you before, mountains are symbolic of being close to God. And so it's it's showing a closeness there because literally Aslan is about to be right in their midst. So there's a closeness uh, to that, which is really, really quite wonderful. And you'll notice the river flows east, which east is symbolic of God. And all throughout these books, uh, east is constantly the direction towards Aslan which is really quite neat. Um, now, it says Jadis hates the world, and I want you to try and figure out why. Uh, it, it says it, and it comes down to how she thinks of herself and how she thinks she's better than everyone else. And so when she hates something, it's because it might be better than her. And so when, it's, when she's in the world, I don't remember the exact... Oh, wait, no, I got it. Page 118 in the little books. Uh, page 118... Uh, they're all listening, and the witch looked as if in a way she understood the music better than any of them. Her mouth was shut, her lips were pressed together, and her fists were clenched. Ever since the song began, she had felt that this whole world was filled with a magic different from hers, and stronger. She hated it. Uh, she would have smashed the whole world or all worlds to pieces if only it would stop the singing. Uh, so she detests anything that can possibly be better than her or stronger than her. And so she absolutely cannot stand all of this. Uh, and all of a sudden they see Aslan. Uh, then when Aslan is creating everything, um, he's singing all of these things into existence and all of the singing uh, matches all the things that are being made, which is fantastic. And then after she throws the bar at the lion, she doesn't miss, it hits him in the head and bounces straight off onto the ground. And at that point, the witch loses it. And like I just said, the reason she loses it is, of course, because that should have killed anything. And the lion is clearly stronger than her, and she, she books it out of there, because at her heart of hearts, she's a coward. Um... So then as soon as the bar falls, they notice back there that it starts growing and immediately Uncle Andrew reverts to his sin, which is greed as well. And so he starts saying like, oh, we could, we could just take bits of metal and plant it in the ground and you could get full battleships that just pop up and we could sell them for millions of dollars and no charge to myself. I could make a, I could make a hotel here that people can come and visit for, for a ridiculous price. And Polly sh really, really stops him and says, you are just like the witch, said Polly. All you think of is killing things, page 132. Um, and then he says, oh, this is the land of youth. And immediately Diggory catches on to that idea because, wait, my mom, if this is the land of youth, maybe something here can save her. Um, and so then all of the animals start getting created and notice again, biblical symbolism, Aslan picks how many of each animal Two. Um, so if you did not notice the Noah reference there, he's picking two of each. Technically, uh, Noah picked seven of clean animals and two of unclean, but that's beside the point. Um, so then with the two that he picks, all of them are able to speak. Uh, which is which is excellent. Page 139, beginning of chapter 10. Um, Aslan tells them to to live and and speak, be walking trees, be talking beasts, be divine waters. And the immediate response of all of the animals that he has just given the ability to speak is, we hear and obey. And they immediately 
say, we, we will do what you have told us. Um, and I love that they say, we, we know. And then good old strawberry pipes up and goes, but, but please, we don't know very much yet. Uh, which the humility is wonderful. Uh, Cabby and strawberry both are, are very humble and it's, it's the sweetest thing. Um, and then there's the first joke, which is the jackdaw of, um, of speaking in the dead silence and everyone starts laughing. And of course it sounds very odd because uh, they're animals and it is the first laughter ever heard in Narnia. And I, I do love what Aslan says, which is laugh and fear not creatures. Now that you are no longer dumb and witless, you need not always be grave for jokes as well as justice come in speech. And they all let themselves go and start laughing. And the, the jackdaw pipes up and Aslan, have I made the first joke? No, little friend, you have only been the first joke, which then is twice as funny. Um, and then as soon as they bring the people over, I love that the jackdaw from this point onward is obsessed with jokes. Uh, he's, he's obsessed that he was the first joke. And then the people show up and he goes, oh, oh, are they the second joke? Are they the second joke? And uh, he's just very, very excited about that. And the panther shuts him down and says, well, if they are, they're not nearly as good as the first one. <laughs> and that's, that's awesome. Um, let's see, what else did we want to go over? Oh yes, Uncle Andrew, he's a tree. Um, no, he's not, but they think he is. Uh, and he almost gets planted upside down, which would have been pretty disastrous. Uh, and when they're shaking him, some stuff falls out of his pockets, uh, which is his money. And, uh, and then, you know, it turns into a tree, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and Uncle Andrew, I, I love that um, what it says about Uncle Andrew and his, um, and his stuff, which is he intentionally cannot understand them. And this is very true for almost all people. Um, and I'm trying to find the exact reference. Um, Okay, yes. Oh, I found it. Okay, it's um, in, in this book, it's page 149. Um, so he saw that it was a lion, uh, and of course it can't really be singing. And the longer and more beautiful the lion sang, page 150, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Now the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. Um, and Uncle Andrew did. He soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song, and soon he, he couldn't have heard anything else, even if he wanted to. And so this is something I normally talk about with the classes every year. Uh, and I'm going to have to say it over video this year. Uh, whenever you sit at a task and you go, oh, there's no way I can do this. I can't do this. And you look at it once. You don't even try. You just look at it and immediately say, oh, this is impossible. It will become impossible. You won't be able to do it. The more you tell yourself, I can't, the more you will be completely unable to. And really that is the most unfortunate thing when someone can convince themselves that they don't in fact have a brain that God gave them and they cannot comprehend anything when in fact you can comprehend mountains of things and just really a ridiculous amount of stuff. And, and yet if you, if you try to tell yourself you can't, you will not be able to. Um, so a good lesson to be learned there from, from uncle Andrew. Um, Let's see, 161, I'm going to skip ahead to, um, doodly do. Uh, so they plant Uncle Andrew, yay for Uncle Andrew, uh, and then they, uh, <laughs> uh, they wake him up with water. Okay, so skipping ahead to page 161, um, Diggory is forced to come face to face with his own sin, um, namely when they woke up Jadis, uh, and it says, it was my uncle. Uh, Aslan, he said, he sent us out of our world by magic rings. At least I had to go. I had to. Notice he's playing an excuse game. I had to go because he sent Polly first. And then we met the witch in a place called Charn and she just held on to us when you met the witch, said Aslan in a low voice, which had the threat of a growl in it. So I'm, I'm, I can't really ask for a show of hands, but I'm guessing a decent number of you, when you've gotten in trouble with your parents before, have kind of tried to play over the worst bits of it where you're the most at fault. And if it's your siblings, you'll, you'll play up their thing. Of, well, we were riding our bikes and, and uh, you know, the, there was a ramp and he decided to jump over it. How did the ramp get there? 
I might have built the ramp and then dared him to jump over it, and I said that I would tease him forever if he didn't. It's maybe my fault. Um, so anyways, he, he says, well, she, we, we met her, and she woke up, said Diggory wretchedly, and then turning very white, well, I mean, I woke her, because I wanted to know what would happen if I struck a bell. Oh, Polly didn't want to. It wasn't her fault. I... I fought her. I know I shouldn't have. I think I was a bit enchanted by the writing under the bell. So he goes from saying, well, we just happened upon this woman, to well, she woke up. Okay, well, I woke her up. And Polly didn't want her to wake up. But I was enchanted. It, it wasn't me. Like, it, it, it was on the bell. What, what was I supposed to do? Fight an enchantment of magic? Um, and he says, so I was, I was a bit enchanted. And Aslan said, do you? Still speaking very low and deep. No, said Diggory. I I see now I wasn't. I was only pretending. There was a long pause, and Diggory was thinking all this time, I have spoiled everything. So it's interesting that the truth hurts way worse when it gets dragged out of you piece by piece than when you just come forth with it immediately. You'll notice that one of Diggory's things is he makes excuses um, to kind of get away with some of his bad behavior and some of the bad things that he's been doing. And this shows up at the very beginning of the book. If you remember, he says he was crying. And he says, well, well, who wouldn't be crying? Who wouldn't be crying if you had if you'd had to leave the country and your pony and your wonderful house and get stuck in a beastly hole like London? Who wouldn't be crying? Now he's throwing a hissy fit because they're there for his, for the sake of his mother, uh, who is who is very sick. That is why they're in London, and yet he's throwing a hissy fit and crying, but he's going to justify that hissy fit to Polly when she first catches him. So one of the things about Diggory is he does ultimately fall into making excuses quite a bit, similar to the Phantom Tollbooth and the Threadbare excuse. Okay, moving on. Sorry, I'm taking longer on this. It's turning into a full lecture, but this is a fantastic book. You can't really blame me. Well, I mean, you could, but... All right, page 165 in this book, wherein Diggory and his uncle are both in trouble, which is chapter 11. Um, with 165, um, how Aslan exhorts uh, the cabbie, who we find out his name is Frank, um, to rule. Uh, and he, he says, well, I, I think I would like it very much, but I, I ain't never had much of an education, you see. Well, said Aslan, can you use a spade and a plow and raise food out of the earth? Yes, sir, I could do a bit of work being brought up to it like can you rule these creatures kindly and fairly remembering they are not slaves like dumb beasts of the world you were born in but talking beasts and free subjects i see that sir replied the cabbie i try to do the square thing by them all and would you bring up your children and grandchildren to do the same it'd be up to me to try sir and i do my best wouldn't we nelly so his wife's name is, is helen but her nickname is nelly which is very sweet um and you wouldn't have favorites either among your own children or among other creatures or let any hold another use, um, uh, hold another or use it hardly. Hardly means badly. Um, I, I never abide such things going on, sir. That's the truth. Uh, I'd give him what I got if I caught him at it, said the cabbie. And all through this conversation, his voice was growing slower and richer, more like the country voice he must have had as a boy and less like the sharp, quick voice of a cockney. Um, so the cockney accent is what I've been doing. Uh, and if enemies came against the land, for enemies will arise, and there was a war, would you be the first in the charge and the last in the retreat? Well, sir, said the cabbie slowly, a chap don't exactly know till he's tried, and I dare say I might turn him over, uh, turn out soft, but I'd never do no fighting with my fists, and I'd, I'd try, that is, I, I hope I'd try to do my best. Then, said Aslan, you will have done all that a king should do. Uh, and that's, that's quite fantastic. Um, and then Aslan returns to Diggory and says, have you forgiven the boy for the violence he did you in the Hall of Images in the desolate palace of the Cursed Charn? Yes, Aslan, we've made it up, said Polly. And that as well. Now for the boy himself. So showing forgiveness how it needs to be asked for and given and that the truth should always come out first instead of making excuses. Um, okay, so then I'm going to skip forward to page 178. Uh, Strawberry is now Fledge, officially. Uh, he is no longer a regular horse. He is a flying horse. Uh, this is in the chapter Strawberry's Adventure, which is chapter 12, uh, page 178 in the small books. Um, and this is a very interesting little tidbit that C.S. Lewis throws in. And it's one of my favorites in any of the books. And I'm guessing you probably didn't catch it. And it's on page 78 when they don't have food. And Diggory complains and he says, well, I do think someone might have arranged about our meals. Notice this is kind of similar to the people of Israel in the wilderness. Um, 
And Fledge says, well, I'm sure Aslan would have if you'd asked him. Well, wouldn't he know without being asked, says Polly. Well, I've no doubt he would, said the horse, still with his mouth full. But I have sort of an idea he likes to be asked. And I love talking about this every year. This is C.S. Lewis explaining why we need prayer. Um, So with just standard stuff, God knows all because he is omniscient. So why do we pray if God already knows all of the things that we need, all of the things that are in our heart that we are... <clears throat> desiring for other people to be healed, for, for blessings upon people in our life, uh, if we have something difficult going on for comfort and help in that. If he already knows all of this, why do we pray? Well, and that's because I- I've rather an idea he likes to be asked. It's not something where you can just say, well, you know, just take care of it. I don't even care. It's it's a relationship with God that is communication. It isn't just a one-sided person in the sky who just bring, here's this, bring, here's this, bring, here's this. It's God giving you a reliance upon himself. When you pray, you're developing that reliance and that relationship. And you're also asking instead of just expecting. And that really is important with anything. It is infinitely better to ask than to expect, because if you expect, you will always be disappointed. And if you ask, that's all you can do is just put it out there and know that God has a plan and maybe maybe answering this prayer is part of that plan for ultimate good or maybe it's not going to be answered because there is something better that will be accomplished by not acting upon this um so that's my little side trail there okay moving on uh page 180 in this book I'm not sure if you noticed this Uh, this is probably my favorite illustration in the whole book. And the reason is because if you look at Fledge and you can see the two children, uh, because of the way my camera is, you can actually see it a lot better. There's the witch. Uh, And you can see her as this darker shadow that's running in the background. Um, So she's following them. Dun, dun, dun. Um, Okay, so they go up this hill, which is almost like a mountain, close to God, and they find a garden. The Garden of Eden. Uh, And Diggory is supposed to pluck he is supposed to pick an apple and he grabs one and he's sitting there kind of thinking, Oh, maybe I could get one for myself. And then he goes, no, no, I won't. And then he sees a bird that was up in the tree watching him. And, uh, and he realizes, well, it just shows said Diggory afterward, page 190, that you can never be too careful in these magical places. You never know what may be watching you, but I think Diggory would not have taken the apple for himself any case. Things like do not steal, I think, were hammered into boys' heads a good deal harder in those days than they are now. Still, we can never be certain. Um, So the the witch comes down, and she's just eaten an apple, and uh, Diggory starts to run for it, and she chases him. And he notices that uh, he walked in through the gate because he knew what he was doing was right of, I'm getting this for Aslan. I have been given permission to come here, therefore it's okay. The witch sneaks in, uh, which is first just bad um and he notices that the witch uh looks stronger and prouder than ever and even in a little way triumphant but her face was deadly white white as salt now that was a little tiny reference to lot's wife uh with the salt and disobeying which is which is pretty fantastic uh and the witch begins a conversation with uh with diggory that's very similar to Uh, Satan as the serpent in the Garden of Eden um, with Adam and Eve. Notably, it's more similar to the conversation with Eve because, of course, Adam never spoke to the snake. Uh, But she says very similar things. With the snake in the Garden of Eden, he says, well, did God really say that this would happen? Are you sure? Because maybe you're just misunderstanding a little. Um, And... uh, and so she starts tempting him in a few ways. And, uh, and she says, you are taking it back to the line, you simpleton. Do you not know what this fruit is? I will tell you. It is the apple of youth, the apple of life. I know, for I have tasted it. And I feel already such changes in myself that I know I shall never grow old or die. Eat it, boy. Eat it. And you and I will both live forever and be king and queen of this whole world, or of your world, if we decide to go back there. No thanks, said Diggory. <laughs> I don't know. I care much about living on and on after everyone I know is dead. I'd rather live an ordinary life, uh, have an ordinary time, die, and then go to heaven. Uh, she says, but what about this mother of yours who you pretend to love so? What's she got to do with it, said Diggory. 
Do you not see, fool, that one bite of this apple would heal her? You have it in your pocket. We are here by ourselves, and the lion is far away. Use your magic and go back to your own world. A minute later, you can be at your mother's bedside giving her the fruit. Five minutes later, you will see the coming back, color coming back to her face. She will tell you the pain is gone. And soon she will tell you she feels stronger. She will fall asleep. Think of that. Hours of sweet, natural sleep without pain. Uh, next, everyone will be saying how wonderfully she is recovered. All will be well again. Your home will be happy and you will be like other boys. Uh, Diggory starts to feel it at that point of, I could save mom. Uh, what has the lion ever done for you that you should be his slave, said the witch. What can he do to you once you're back in your own world? And what would your mother think if she knew you could have taken her pain away uh, and saved your father's heart from being broken and that you wouldn't? Uh, that you'd rather run messages for a wild animal in a strange world that has no business of yours. And so she just keeps hammering in doubt after doubt after doubt and laying on guilt of what would your mom say if... She knew you could have saved her life, and you didn't. And that's just ugh, low, awful, no. Um, so then she says he's cruel and pitiless and heartless, uh, and Diggory's telling her to stop talking. Uh, and and then he says, well, well, mother taught me morals, and she would never want me to steal, ever. And the witch so, plays her final card, and it is the worst one to play, which is, she doesn't need to know, which is exactly what uh, what the snake says to Eve of God won't know. It's okay. No one, no one's gonna see. It's all fine. Um, she said you wouldn't have to tell her how you got the apple. Your father need never know. No one in your world need know anything about this whole story. You don't even need to take the little girl back with you. You know. And here was the fatal mistake because of course the one thing that Diggory is is he's very selfless. And he, he would never leave someone behind. And so here, the virtue is combating the sin. And that, that's wonderful. And immediately, Polly says, well, good for you. That was awesome. Way to, way to stand up to her. Um, okay, so then we go back to Uncle Andrew. Uh, he has been uh, kept as a pet at this point. Uh, people are bringing him food. And I think my favorite on page 201, uh, Planting of the Tree is the chapter, uh, the bear, who's trying to be so sweet and bring him some food, um, the bear was especially kind. During the afternoon, he had found a wild bee's nest, and instead of eating it himself, which he very much would have liked to have done, this worthy creature brought it back to Uncle Andrew. But this was, in fact, the worst failure of all. The bear lobbed the whole sticky mass over the top of the enclosure, and unfortunately, it hit Uncle Andrew slap in the face. And not all of the bees were dead. The bear, who would not at all have minded being hit in the face by a honeycomb himself, could not understand why Uncle Andrew staggered back, slipped, and sat down. And it was just sheer bad luck that he sat down on the pile of thistles, which the uh, which the donkey had brought. Uh, and then they, they name him, because he's their pet, uh, so they name him Brandy, because that's the noise he made so often. Um, and so here again, Uncle Andrew is asking for more alcohol, because he's not a good person. And, uh, and so they, they name him that. And they have to end up leaving him in the night. And then they bring him back. And they say, well, well, Aslan, can't you fix him? And Aslan says, the only thing I can do is make him fall asleep. Because he, he has convinced himself that he cannot hear anything as words. And it will not help. So he helps him fall asleep. And then we have the gold and silver trees to make the crowns, which were created because of the money that fell out of Uncle Andrew's pockets. There are, of course, coins, um, gold and silver coins. So there you go. Uh, and the king's crown is set with rubies and the queen's with emeralds. Green and red. Yay. Um, and then he's talking to Diggory a bit about the witch and all that she has has just done um and he he says well you know she she took it she seemed fine and he said well the thing is uh, it works according to its nature she's won her heart's desire she has unwearying strength and endless days like a goddess uh but the length of days with an evil heart is only a length of misery and already she begins to know it and she almost instantly realizes why and that's ch uh, page 208 sorry um and uh and then he says the same thing about Diggory's mother. He says, you know, if you had taken one for yourself or for your mother, it would have been the same thing of just endless days of misery um, that, that just never, never go away. Uh, and she, she 
uh, page 207, he says, that is why all the rest are now such a horror to her. That is what happens to those who pluck and eat fruits at the wrong time and in the wrong way. The fruit is good, but they loathe it forever. Um, because the right thing done in the wrong way always leads to ruin. The wrong thing done in the wrong way will always lead to ruin. Uh, and that's something that my old teacher, Dr. Grant, used to say all the time and was, was very good. And then finally, the tree in the backyard. Um, so he, he is allowed to take the apple back to his mother because he didn't steal it. It was given to him from this new tree that has just sprouted up by the water. Uh, so he takes it back to his mother, cuts it up for her, and the fruit heals her. And then he, he ends up burying the pit from the apple, the core, and it sprouts into a beautiful tree. Not a tree of life, but the fruit from it is fantastic. And that tree is back there, and they plant the magic rings around it. And then ultimately there's a, a storm, and the tree is used for a very specific purpose, which sets up other books. Oh, and last thing, sorry, speaking of setting up other books... They say that um, this evil has come into the world, and Aslan says, well, this world will be able to be merry for a very long time, um, and ultimately the worst of the evil will fall on myself. Which, if you've read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think you know what that's referring to, hopefully. All right, I am, I'm sorry that this has been a little bit longer, but this will definitely be very helpful for you in filling out the study guide. Um, and, and finding those things, because I know I ask for on there uh, some of the symbolism of Christianity and of the Bible that's, that's in the book. And there are just really some fantastic examples. Um, Tree of Life, Tempting of the Guard, there's, there's a lot. Uh, so anyways, hopefully this will help you. And I hope you have a wonderful day.